can someone have the microphone open, open if you can close it yeah yeah perfect, perfect. no i still no, can't hear myself can hear oh let me go ahead and, and mute yeah let me go ahead i'm gonna go ahead and mute everybody oh no wait no 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 there we go now yes Perfect. So thank you for having us. It's re a real pleasure. Uh, my name is Luis Anjinguren. I'm the Senior International Officer for the Americas and Europe. And as you can hear from my accent, I'm originally from Venezuela. I came to study a, a few years ago, do my second bachelor's, and I had an amazing time. So it really is, I really love my job because I talk to the students and I share my own experience as an international student in the UK. My, pres my presentation is simply a very brief introduction to Sussex, and so you get to know a little bit more of the university and the amazing city of Brighton. So uh, when your students ask all the students, if, any, if, if there is a student present, you can see you know, the amazing, the, the amazing uh, magic of Brighton. Very quickly, let's start. We are located in the southeast of the UK. The UK is an amazing country with an amazing history. But it's very, very geographically, it's very small. It's actually smaller than Alabama. So we say here, 100, uh, 100 years is nothing, but 100 miles is a long way to go. So it's part of, of you know, all the difference and all the, between the cultures and the countries. And I think it's, it's part of the magic to study in the UK. You will see now our campus. We are one of the eight universities with a physical campus. We are located just outside Brighton and which is about four and a half miles from the university to the city center. That is about nine minutes by train, 25 minutes by bus. Brighton is less than an hour away from London and half an hour away from Gatwick, which is the second largest airport in the UK and the gate to Europe. So your students will have the opportunity to visit any country in Europe from Gatwick. And that is also some, you know, something I still take advantage of. This is a picture of the campus looking north Look at, looking towards London, and we are a medium-sized university, maybe medium small-sized university with about 20,000 students. Of those 5,000, about five, five and a half are international from 140 different countries. And one of the most amazing things I experienced while studying in the UK was the opportunity to get to know the world at my university. It's having, you know, the, the opportunity to share with different cultures and different belief and people with different views was one of the most fulfilling experience I've ever had. Um, you realize we're all socially constructed and we all see the world or a problem in different ways depending where we are. However, the most amazing thing for me was not realizing the difference between other students is how similar we can be, even if we come from different, different from completely different places. So, you know, it does one thing that your students will have, you know, uh, the opportunity to share with 140 different nationalities. And that for me was utterly amazing. The university, you will know, is very well known for international development. We have been ranked for seven years running the best university in the world for uh, development studies. We also uh, were uh, chosen last, uh, in 2021, the first university in the world for student diversity. That was a survey that uh, 108,000 students from all over the world uh, answered for about 8,000 universities. And they were asked about the environment, the classes, the support, the open-mindedness of the place, and Sussex came first. We also have 12 of our subjects in the uh, top 100 in the QS ranking. We have the largest UK business school by research income, and we are in the top 50 for, uh, in the world for the impact of the sustainable development goals. So it is an amazing university with, you know, an amazing, amazing degrees and amazing academics, as we are going to see in a few minutes. For entry requirements, the students need to do a master with us. All masters are one year long, and they need a GPA of 3.3 out of 4. Okay, Our fees are slightly less expensive than in the US. Uh, they vary between 18,000 or 18,000 pounds to 23,000. And, and living expenses is about 12,000 pounds a year. And that includes accommodation, travel, books, and food. Of course, students can spend a little more, but that is an approx of how much a student will need uh, through that year. Accommodation is available at the university. If students apply before the deadline, they're guaranteed accommodation. We don't, all rooms are single. We have about 6,000 rooms uh, on campus and they are all single. We don't have roomies. 
half of them are in suite, so they have their own bathroom, and the other one you share the bathroom with uh, with other students, and which is a bit different to the US, but they all have usually rooms. We have a uh, rooms on campus, but we also have rooms in the city. In that picture, you can see the, the campus at the bottom of the picture and beautiful Brighton at the, at the end. Um, and, see, and students can uh, choose to live on campus and to live in the city during the first during your, their masters. I have lived in the UK for 21 years now, nine years in Brighton, and Brighton is my favorite city so far. It, it's an amazing place. It has is known by two nicknames. One is London by the Sea because in the moment the sun is out, London comes down. If you have ever been in London, I I feel like Brighton is like Camden Town by the Sea. It's a it's a fantastic place. The other nickname is the Independent Republic of Brighton because those hippies down there are not English, and it, that is how I feel when I moved here nine years ago. I really thought I moved countries and I didn't realize. It's a city of art. It's a city of music. It's a city of a festival, it's a city of uh, open minded gender. It's an amazing place, a place like no other. There is some quotes there that I absolutely adore, but it really is one of the most amazing and more, 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 one of the most unique places I've ever lived. Also, something that makes the city very special is how connected it is with sustainability. We were the first city in the UK to get a gold award for the standards in sustainability and food and, and farming, and that was part as well of the Living Coast, which is the Brighton and Lewis Biosphere Reserve, which is a UNESCO reserve, the first one in the UK. And the idea is to create an equilibrium between city, farming, and nature. And it's an amazing, amazing place to be in many, many, many ways. Also, not only the city is fantastic, our alumni is amazing, I like, because we're a young university, and alumni are quite young. You may recognize one person here, but I won't mention any names, but I like them because they're young and they're successful and they have taken, you know, and they're some of them just graduated last year as well. And and that is one of the things I love talk, I love I love about working with Sussex um, is seeing the students or students who want to change the world and make a difference. And that's amazing. Uh, a student we had a few years ago was ex-president Carlos Alvarado Quesada of Costa Rica, and he has have, have come twice to the university to talk to the students and share their experience as well. Very lastly, I have a small video of an American student that she shares her experience uh, as a student and, and, and um, as an alumni uh, in the US. Just give me a sec. I'm Bianca Serafini and I went to Sussex for English language and literature. I came from a small Italian school in New York City that allowed me to access the British university system. It was hands down the best experience of my life. I chose Sussex, truth be told, because my brother really wanted me to go to Brighton and at the end of the day it was really good advice. Um, because Brighton is such an art mecca and I knew that I wanted to be in entertainment and I wanted to be among artists. After graduation, I moved back to New York City and I started working for a startup called Filmrise. I worked in sales for six or seven months until um, an executive producer had tapped me to start the originals department, uh, which I did for the better part of three years, um, and then slowly segued into starting another department for Filmrise, which was the digital acquisitions department, where I served as director. Besides English being a really important degree for a variety of different jobs, it it's definitely helped me in entertainment in terms of my creativity and my writing skills that I acquired, you know, being an English major at Sussex has really come in handy. You have to do what you're passionate about because you really do only have one life and I um, can't believe I'm saying that, <laughs> but it's, it's true and it's, it's how you want to spend the 24 hours of your day that are really important because you only have 24 hours every day. If you have any questions and you want to know more about the university or you want to know more about Sussex or any enter requirements or any degree in particular, please be feel very, very free to uh, contact me because I'm, um, I will be a pleasure to talk to you and help you as much as I can. So this is me for now. Just gonna say, I'm going to share now and I invite our fantastic academic, Dr. Rebecca, to join us. And let me stop sharing to join. And now the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Lua. It's great to see uh, that you know wonderful talk and all the images and things. Uh, can you see my talk? No yet. Is that possible? No. Oh. Now we are seeing it. Wait, wait. Yes, we can see it now. You can see four minutes about global poverty. Yeah. Yes, correct. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, so hi everybody. Welcome to this lecture. It is an introductory lecture to a master's level class that I teach here at Sussex. Um, the class or module, as we tend to call them, is poverty, vulnerability, and the global economy. And it is an option on many of our master's degrees in international development, including the master's that I convene. And the title of today's lecture is for myths about global poverty. Before we go on, introductions. My name is Rebecca Princess. Uh, I'm a reader, uh, I guess the US equivalent with associate professor in anthropology and international development. I've taught at the University of Sussex for more than 10 years. Uh, I'm also the academic convener for two courses in anthropology, the MA in social anthropology and the MA in the anthropology of development and social transformation. Um, my research is on labor development, focusing on labor rights in the global garment industry, especially in Bangladesh and the Caribbean. Uh, but I also teach and work on microcredit, labor migration, gender, and digital labor platforms. So a key question for us today is what is poverty? And I'd like you to think for a moment about how um, you picture poverty. What images come to mind? And I thought we would, uh, we might like to use the chat box and put in ideas, but let's leave that to the side of the moment um, so that I can, I can get through it a little bit more quickly. Um, so if we were in a classroom together, you'd all be seated at seminar tables, having a discussion with other students in your group, and then you would present back to the group as a whole, kind of what, what your thoughts are on this. Um, but some of the things we might consider is, you know, who do we picture in our minds when we hear about chronic intergenerational poverty? Do we picture entire groups of people, communities, neighborhoods, even regions and countries? Or do we conceptualize poverty as an individual phenomenon? Um, what settings or places do we associate with poverty? Slums? informal housing settlements, rural or urban areas? Um, what about workplaces where jobs are known to be um, arduous and, and difficult, like brick kilns, um, agricultural camps, or garment sweatshops? Um, or do we think about you know, public clinics and other healthcare settings? What ethnicities or groups of people do we associate with poverty? Uh, and how does this change from society to society? Do we associate poverty with migrant groups such as refugees or undocumented workers? And how are ideas of poverty racialized? And finally, what do we tend to overlook about poverty? What is left out? What, what people do we often fail to associate with poverty? even if their material conditions suggest that they are poor, struggling to meet their nutritional needs, or needs for secure housing, health care, rights, and jobs. What are the hidden forms of poverty? I always think it's interesting to come at these issues by putting in a little Google image search to see what images of poverty pop up for us. And, you know, we're all kind of doing this from different parts of the world. So it'd be interesting for you to get a try and see what images um, pop up for you. If you just put poverty into an image search. Um, for me, we can see here an emphasis on the places where poor people are thought to live. Slums, informal settlements where there is lack of electricity, running water, paved streets, lights, um, housing that is secure and permanent. And we can also see here the association between poverty and certain forms of work, such as the arduous household tasks uh, like 
water gathering that is usually undertaken by women and children. So, um, you know, I'd like you to, to have a look at yours. It's time at the end when I come up the, the presentation. Maybe we can have a little chat about the images that popped up for you. Um, and I, you know, there's many, many different ways of reading these images. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that we have to read them as big images of the lack of resources. A different way of reading these images is to think about uh, these are images of political disenfranchisement. These are images of people who uh, have a lack of rights, and that's the problem. Um, another thing that you might notice from this images is the persistent association between poverty and children. Children represented as innocent victims of poverty. Uh, the reason why we see so many photos of children in poverty is that the image of the impoverished child can be used to garner support for development projects, to pluck at the heartstrings of donors, and to create support amongst multilateral institutions. And so it's worth reflecting on why images of children are so effective in, in mobilizing support for anti-poverty campaigns in a way that images of poor adults, um, you know, tend to fail. Uh, I note here on the bottom of the slide uh, a reading that we do for this in my class called A World Without Innocence. Okay, so in development studies and practice, defining poverty has long been the terrain of economics. Chronic, long-term, extreme, and persistent poverty is a huge problem in the world, and it often becomes defined through its very measurement, defined by economists with um, measuring poverty, um, income inequality, and poverty gaps, poverty lines. Uh, and development is often so concerned with stimulating economic growth, raising GDP. So even these become important measures for policymakers even as they have to be paired with attention to the unequal distribution of economic gains. Now, if this all sounds very economic, researchers and policymakers now realize that non-economic measures are also important, such as infant and maternal mortality, nutritional intake, these kinds of things um, are captured with the Human Development Index, which I'll we'll talk more about later. Before we move on, I thought it was worthwhile to think about why poverty matters so much. Since the 1990s, poverty eradication has been central to development agendas, um, even being seen as the very purpose of development. We see that shifting a little bit with the drive towards sustainability and green economies. Um, but at, you know, 1990s, especially with Millennium Development Goals, really made a push for uh, global cooperation to combat poverty. Um, and how this concept is defined matters very much, because how you define a problem shapes what you think of as an appropriate solution. So some define the problem of poverty as insufficiency, not having enough. Others define the problem of poverty as inequality. There's enough, there's enough there, but the resources are not being evenly distributed around. So whether you diagnose the problem as one or the other makes a difference to what you think is an appropriate solution. But also the definition of poverty is important because millions of people around the world are subject to national and international policies to tackle poverty, meaning they have a direct experience of being labeled and categorized and targeted. And this process is worthy of analysis as well. One way for thinking about why is the very concept of poverty so important to development is to bust some of those myths about poverty and global development. So I'm going to lay these out for you and then we're going to unpack them one by one. First myth is that global poverty is falling thanks to development institutions. Second myth 
that we can measure poverty's social factors, not just economic factors. Third myth, poverty is an individual phenomenon based on poor personal choices. And finally, that poverty is an exceptional circumstance rather than the norm. So let's start with the first one. My graphic here shows the decline of global poverty since the 1990s. This is known as the good news narrative about poverty, which um, anthropologist Jason Hickel writes about in his book, The Divide. In the year 2000, global heads of state met at the United Nations in New York to set out an ambitious poverty reduction um, program, what would become known as Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs. Among these goals was to cut global poverty in half by 2015. And whereas this image of poverty falling over time appears to be a self-evident success story, the numbers contained in the good news narrative are both manipulable and manipulated. So first of all, even though the Millennium Development Goals were created in 2000, the timeline for achieving the goal was updated in order to take advantage of the progress already being made in reducing poverty. So if we cover up those early years that the um, MDGs attempt to take credit for, suddenly the graph looks less impressive in terms of the drop in global poverty. Supposedly, this graph shows that the international consensus of the 1990s set a good path for the eradication of poverty. Oh gosh, I'm losing my notes as I talk. I want to be really precise, so let me stay on task. Um, so, um, Yes, and so what is this international consensus I'm talking about? It's the neoliberal policy agenda that gained preeminence at the end of the Cold War. We often summarize it as being about um, trade liberalization, deregulation, privatization, all these kind of capitalistic driven uh, policies for um, growing economies and reducing poverty. But actually, I'll just move this so you can look really carefully. Actually, if you look closely, the greatest drop in poverty represented by the purple comes from China, which did not closely follow the international consensus. So it is a myth to say that this graph proves global, global poverty is falling and that there's a good news narrative about the success of the neoliberal policy agenda promoted by the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the WTO, not to mention um, U.S. foreign policy as well. What this graph actually shows is the persistence of poverty in many parts of the world. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it shows poverty to be getting worse. And when you consider how via structural adjustment, so many African countries adopted the neoliberal policy package, um, you know, on the promise that this is what would lift their countries out of poverty, to see it not in a decline, but in the rise, suggests the very opposite of what the graph purports to show. These policies pushed by donors and institutions often based in the global north have failed the global poor. China took a different path and got different results. Um, but, you know, thinking back to our, our, our discussion about poverty earlier, it's not only about money. Uh, we should think about poverty as being about political representation, voice, rights to common good. So a more complex and holistic understanding of well-being is needed in order to get to grips with the problem of poverty. All right, on to the next myth. I said that defining poverty has long been the terrain of economics, and this is true. Economists measure poverty using a range of quantitative tools like you know, poverty lines, who's living on $2 a day, that sort of thing. And there have been various attempts to bring in social factors. This means moving from looking at income 
to bringing in measures of well-being. But to bust this myth, my argument is social factors cannot be so readily reduced to quantification. To really understand the poverty, you need qualitative analysis as well, which is what we do as anthropologists. Um, even when we're looking at social indicators, it's quest to quantify. And what's wrong with that? Well, most poverty research works with a model of knowledge from the natural sciences, presenting the social world as if there are objective facts to be discovered, and all we need to do is refine our techniques for discovering them, and we can create predictive theories be universally applied across all societies in order to tackle poverty. But this approach is doomed to disappointment. Why? Because a focus on measurement is the characteristic of individuals and households and doesn't pay enough attention to the structural processes that move people in and out of poverty. What happens then is poverty becomes equated with what can be measured. And it leaves out all the politics of poverty that actually shape what's going on. And it also neglects how communities relate to each other hierarchically. And it's out of discussion how some are poor because others are rich, or we'll the relational approach to poverty. So instead, we need to take on board qualitative anthropological approaches, go to the place where impoverished people live and work and migrate uh, to gain a more complex understanding of this phenomena from people's own contextualized view. So I won't linger on this slide because I know I, I, I'm short of time, but we can talk about this more if you have any questions. The third myth is that poverty is an individual phenomenon based on poor personal choices. What we know about global poverty is that it is geographically, politically, and economically patterned, meaning that chronic intergenerational enduring poverty is almost never individualized. It affects whole communities and places. So there is this sort of iconic in, um, image of the poor individual who has suffered misfortune, one person begging in the streets. And we see this commonly in cities all over the world. But even this is patterned. There are structural causes relating to housing, healthcare, conflict and displacement that explain the kind of seemingly individual instances of poverty we might see in the streets of even the world's most wealthy cities. As a global phenomenon, poverty must be understood as a community phenomenon. And it has structural drivers. Individual choice and good decision-making aren't really the important things when we are talking about structural poverty. Um, too often, policies focus on the individual in poverty and this means social mobility. This tends to mobilize um, policies that focus on the rational choice of the individual. We call this methodological individualism, and it refers to the treatment of the individual in poverty as the subject of policy interventions. And the individual is going to need certain assistance, like job training or microfinance or cash transfers so that these individuals can make a rational choice to move from poverty to a better job or better life chances, um, such as getting a job or starting a pro enterprise. One of the main problems with this focus on the individual is that the effects of poverty uh, are often misinterpreted as causes of poverty. Things like indebtedness, addiction, health outcomes, not being able to save money or buy cheap options in, in the long term. And if I think about you know, poverty here in the UK and how um, impoverished households pay much more for their electricity than well, a better off households because poorer households um, buy their electricity in small units, especially if they're in rent accommodation, they buy those top up cards. Whereas if you own your own home, you can search around for the best deal, you can get long-term electricity um, services. Um, 
And finally, you know, we have this critique of the culture of poverty says, that we know um, feeds into a lot of blaming of the poor uh, for their circumstances. Fourth and finally is the myth that poverty is an exceptional circumstance, that it is rare or an aberration, uh, rather than a fundamental, some might say even necessary feature of how our global capitalist economy is organized, that poverty is a feature of global capitalism rather than a bug. And I'm coming to the end of the lecture, so I won't say much about this, except to introduce two concepts that I think help us think about the issue. The first is social exclusion. When you hear people say, ah, all poor need is to be included in the market. Uh, this is the claim of microfinance initiatives, many of which attempt to create the economic empowerment of women by offering small loans to help them start micro enterprises. In my class, we take a deep dive into microfinance initiatives and the many problems with it as a solution to poverty. People certainly need to be included in the economy, but the way they are included matters as much as that they are included. This brings us to the second concept of adverse incorporation. This concept points to the fact that what makes people poor is not always because they're excluded from economic relations, but because they are exploited by them, either in terms of labor practices or predatory lending or dispossession of their land, make way for large scale development projects. So this is a question to keep in mind. Are people poor because they are outside economic relations or are they poor because of the nature of their inclusion in them? Um, we know, for example, that multinational corporations search the world for cheap labor, to make the products we all use today, everything from electronics to clothing. The decarbonization of our economy, a big part of climate change mitigation, relies upon the extraction of minerals that dispossesses people from land and can destroy local habitats. These problems are not rare, they are widespread. So helping us see this helps us understand how normal the experience is for billions of people um, to be part and parcel of the global economy. It's also hand in hand with this experience of poverty. So what we work with or propose in my class is to take a critical anthropological approach. I like the work of David Moss on this, where he talks about an approach that helps us see poverty as the consequence of historically developed economic political relations. An approach that rejects that methodological individualism and neoliberal rational choice models to instead focus on the importance of social processes, social relations and relations of power. Uh, in my own research on microenterprise in the Caribbean, I look at these very issues at the demise of the garment industry, which sort of fell apart in the early 2000s, with the rise of China and Bangladesh, the global powerhouse exporting garments to the world. I'm looking at how former garment workers, as their factories shut down, were encouraged to become micro entrepreneurs to take out a loan to start their own small business but what this business ultimately entailed was working for those factories that used to employ them doing the same kinds of work with fewer rights uh, with lower pay and with um, fewer entitlements so doing the same work but in more adverse conditions and didn't lead to the economic empowerment they had been promised so to conclude the lecture Portion, we need to question the view of poverty as economic, quantifiable, individual, and exceptional. We need to focus on the human experience of poverty, as well as their reflections and analysis, their situation. This means investigating poverty empirically with field-based studies to really see what's going on. Uh, at the same time, not just to look at poverty, but look at the interventions to combat poverty, 
from this same kind of rooted grassroots view. And the broader questions we can look at is the question of whether the real problem is insufficiency, not having enough, or inequality, that what we have is not evenly distributed. What do we make of various interventions by governments, by civil society, businesses, and other actors to combat poverty? And then so the more philosophical questions we tackle in my classes are things like, can a world with billionaires be a fair world? What would that look like? So like I said earlier, I teach master's students here in our School of Global Studies, one of our many schools in Sussex. Here's a list that gathers together some of what we offer in international development. And as you can see, we have a wide variety of masters that look at these issues of development from all different sorts of perspectives, focusing on anthropology or climate change, conflict, food, gender and violence, human rights, migration, media, and social development. Each of these courses was developed by a research faculty like myself to reflect the best of our scholarship working at the forefront of development studies. And before I go, what I want to say, kind of chiming with what um, Lewis was talking about earlier, is that what's really special about Sussex, and not just in the School of Global Studies, is the interdisciplinarity of our courses. Um, you have some teachers with your cohort and some with students coming at the issues from a very, very different angle. And our university was founded in the 1960s to be a new kind of university, one that put multidisciplinarity at its core, bringing together different areas and types of study in innovative ways. Um, and so both as researchers and teachers, we embrace this. And I think this is why uh, development studies are so strong in our university. And we've been um, named first in the world for, for the past seven years. Um, because even just thinking about this issue of poverty, it only takes a moment to see its importance to issues of global health, to issues of gender violence, to issues of migration and displacement, climate crisis, and so much more. So I'm happy to answer questions on our postgraduate studies in anthropology, which I have special affection for as an academic convener. Um, so happy to take questions specific to that. But many thanks for listening. Thank you very, very much, Rebecca. That was fantastic and enlightening and has certainly made me consider um, a lot in a very different context, specifically the uh, analogy you made towards energy and sort of thinking about the broader concept of that and how that relates to um, patterns of access and patterns of um, sort of social justice. So thank you for raising that point. Um, I'd like to open the floor then to all of the present members of the established crew. Does anyone have any questions for our guests? Um, any sort of requests or uh, bits of information they'd like to get about Sussex? The floor is open. <laughs> if you want to pop them into the chat, that's totally fine. If you're comfortable coming on camera, that's absolutely fine as well. So I open it up to you guys. Well, I would say actually, um, whilst I, I, oh, favorite parts of being at Sussex, guys. Louise, do you want to start? In my, in my case, is I look after all international scholarships as well. So Fulbright, Marshall, Chivening, and all the sponsors. And the, the student, the profile of students of Sussex are those who want to change the world. They want to make a difference or a community level or the country level. And it's amazing to talk to them and to, to see them, you know, in, in a in a time when the world seems to have gone absolutely insane, there are still students who want to change the world and, and really fight for a community, fight for, you know, for things that in my case matter, coming from a country with a lot of poverty. So it's, it's inspiring. It's, you know, in those moments when sometimes you're thinking I had enough, you know, talking to those students is, is amazing. And it's, I think it's why I love working in Sussex so much. Because it's hopefully, you know, it's, it gives me hope. Yeah. As, 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 you know, it, it sounds a bit rehearsed, but it's true. 
I, I echo that with working with Marshalls, Luis. I absolutely agree with you. I feel like the world will be a better place because of the students that I work with and the students that the wonderful universities established here send us. So yeah, I echo that 100%. How about you, Rebecca? Do you want to talk a wee bit about what your sort of favorite parts of being at Sussex are? Yeah, I mean, I think that, well, I can start by saying some of my favorite work at being at Sussex is working with master's students, both overseeing some master's courses and providing that advisory role to students as they're developing their course of study, choosing their options, and most importantly, developing dissertation topic for independent summer research that they're going to be doing, either um, overseen by faculty and academic faculty and, and really doing a very academic study, or doing it as a research placement in a relevant organization where they really get embedded with in an organization doing the work in the field they're interested in and doing research with that and write that up as their dissertation. Uh, I just love working with master's students because they bring such vitality to our institution. And part of the reason for that is that they come, many from the UK, but a predominant number from around the world, from every continent, and they come for a year, they are motivated to make the most of it. And they um, form such a close bond amongst one another. We just had a 10-year reunion of some, some master's students who I taught a decade ago who kind of came back from all over the world and just had a reunion um, to see one another. And they kept professional links over all of that time. And um, and so I just think there's something very special about doing the one-year master's with us that um, it, it gives a lot to us. And I, and I hope we, yeah, we put a lot into it as well. Well, I think that's a really beautiful note to end on this afternoon. Thank you both uh, for your time, for your generosity and offering such beautiful viewpoints on Sussex and then Rebecca for your wonderful uh, professional expertise and Louise for sort of peppering your experience in there as well. I always love to hear from someone who's come from abroad and sort of has made their home from the UK. It's something I very heavily identify with and so do a lot of Marshalls as well. Um, I appreciate you both and I think we'll we'll call it quits there but I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. Uh, this is our second to last session of Marshall Mondays. Uh, we'll have one further session going for the University of Kent, who will be our final one. But today I send lots of love and great and grit or sort of gratefulness out to the University of Sussex. Thank you very much for your time today, Thank guys. You. Take care. See Bye. you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.